Jason's the deputy director of um, Jason Ice is the deputy director of the Global Green Growth Institute's London office. Um, obviously, you're now an international organisation, but born of the energy and leadership of, of South Korea, um, wh who we've been hearing a lot about already today. So, Jason, do you want to add your your comments um, to what we've heard this morning? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, let me actually start off, maybe, because <coughs> I think it's deeply relevant by saying what I would consider green growth to be and why it might not quite be, um, uh, what is it, old wine in new bottles. Um, the and and you know it's it's I think it's you know there is a degree to which obviously sustainable development and green growth very much talk about the same thing. But I think um, there's one element of the perspective, at least that that I would I would hold, which is which is somewhat different. Um, and essentially, it's oh, for actually I should start off by saying when I speak of green growth, I do think of inclusive green growth. So there's an element of the debate that sees green growth as specifically around the environmental and economic analysis or nexus, and then of course there's what I would call inclusive green growth that inherently includes uh, social elements. So this gets to a bit of the conversation that we've been having about um, Steph's piece. Um, essentially the way I, we would envision green growth, um, you know, elements of social inclusion, uh, poverty reduction, uh, improvements in human development would be integral to what a green growth agenda needs to look like. So I, first of all, I think it's just worth s stating that because it, it sets the framework for what we're talking about. So um, you know, certainly our vision of it is, is does include the three pillars that I think Alex was, was mentioning. Um, but going beyond sustainable development, I think what green growth tries to focus on more is the fact that it's a transformative process. That essentially it's not simply uh, you know, what I would think sustainable development looked at, which is how do we make sure growth is compatible with environmental benefits and some degree of social social uh, inclusion. It's about saying that social inclusion and environmental elements are integral to economic development and you actually need a transformation of the entire system in order for that whole thing to work. And why is the transformation approach, or why is this, why is this differ, I think, in some fundamental ways? In some ways it's because of the, the real increased pressure that we're feeling from climate change, which makes a real transformation uh, apparently uh, imperative. And also because I think what we're, s we're increasingly seeing is, is real resource uh, scarcity at a level that was never, you know, never contemplated, um, where we may be actually a sort of modern Malthusian trap in which certain key resources the economy relies on simply aren't available at the levels that will allow the entire planet to live at, at um, a certain level of development. So given some of these very fundamental pressures which differ from the past, and then green growth has tried to take a, a more transformational approach. And this, in this, this also sort of demonstrates itself in a, a very strong focus on innovation, which I think is Alec, as Alex mentioned, in a way is the, the core um, facilitator of, of transformation at this scale. And the reason, I, the reason I think it's important to emphasize that at the beginning is because it very much frames my answer to the question that we've been tackling about rebalancing in Asia and what it what might mean. And I think my perspective at this point is that all the key elements of rebalancing in Asia will have good green growth impacts, but they will be incremental impacts. Mm -hmm. They will not be transformational impacts. And there's nothing in the rebalancing formula that suggests that we'll have a transformational change in the way that inclusive green growth um, essentially envisions. Right. So you know, if we look at some of the key things one by one, I think you know I agree with um, you know with Dr. Kawai that there's many positive. Um, elements to them. So, you know, the, the, the um, improvement in, in overall wealth um, in Asia, um, the increasing uh, desire for better environmental quality, you know, those are all incremental improvements that are certainly in improving our, you know, the greenness of growth. Um, the, alongside that, the, the embodiment of more efficient technologies and production processes, all the things that are happening as, as Asia grows and rebalances, those are, are positive uh, impacts, but they're they're still largely incremental. Um, same goes for the transformation in supply chains. I think the globalization of supply chains has, as Dr. Kawai pointed out, really helped increase the the productivity um, and brought best available technology to to many growing countries earlier in their development cycle, which is a very good um, you know move in terms of greenness. But it is incremental. It is still following the same development cycle largely that all other countries have followed historically, and the one that's essentially gotten us into some of the, the difficulties that we, that we face today. Um, the same goes for sort of the general uh, rebalancing of the, of the balance of payments. You know, it's, it's interesting, um, and you know, what it will mean in terms of, uh, you know, does production shift back to, to the West to some degree? What does increased consumption by the Chinese consumer mean? You know, those are all going to be interesting changes, but I don't see anything in that that would transform any of the economies 
involved. Uh, it's, simply, it's simply a shifting of the balance of production. It's not a shifting in the structure of production in any way, right? So, um, so again, you know, a good, potentially good incremental effect, but not clear. You know, when it comes to innovation, I think, which is, you know, a key point that Alec made, you know, similarly, the, the chart that, that Alex put forward was, you know, an instructive one. You know, everyone's, you know, the countries as they're developing are tending to increase the amount that they're innovating. It makes a lot of sense as countries catch up mm -hmm. economically, um, they, they run through the innovation that's been done before they've, before they've reached a certain level of development. They've done the capital accumulation. They've caught up, as it were, and they're going to need to help push the frontier of innovation for future growth. Uh, again, though, it's an incremental process, you know, except perhaps for South Korea, <coughs> which has made you know, a very clear and bold step in terms of innovation towards the challenges of green growth. There's no other country that you can see any kind of step change in the way innovation is being done. It's a typical increase in innovation in the way we saw in Japan in, in the you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, the way we've seen in Korea uh, more recently. It's perhaps a bit different, but in every other country, China is very much following a pattern that we've seen in many countries in the past. So I'm sort of starting to beat a dead horse, but you can, you can, see, you can see where I'm getting, um, where I'm getting at. Now, I guess sort of one last caveat I would say about the rebalancing. Uh, if there is one element, in fact, that might even be against a, a transformation. It's, it might sound odd, but in, so, in some ways, the, the move from savings to consumption may be exactly in the opposite direction of what's required in the long run for the systematic transformation that we're looking at. In fact, most long-term studies point to a need to ra you know, radically increase investment in the next 20 years. And so you know, rather than seeing all of Asia rechannel everything to consumption, it might be more productive to see it rechanneled towards the transformative infrastructure, um, energy, and other types of investments that would really enable a green growth transformation. So, you know, so rebalancing, um, you know, not clear, and certainly not in my mind at this stage pointing to a, a green growth shift. Um, you know, in terms of sort of final words, you know, the the fundamental basis for this kind of transformation is is pretty clear. Um, it's been, you know, discussed for decades now. You know, it's a matter of a massive internalization of things that aren't internalized in our current economic markets, right? It's the, the, the cost for the costs of climate change, as well as um, other very large uh, sources of health effects and, and pollution. Um, it's also a valuation of future generations in a way that doesn't tend towards zero after a few decades. Um, it's understanding that um, you know, the constraints on, on resources might not simply be, um, simply be uh, have, you know, have general and gradual effect on future generations, but might have you know, catastrophic implications. Um, you know, this is, you know, this is important, again, you know, because in the past it was very easy to have a growth model that said, as long as we're growing, don't worry about future generations, they're going to be fine, because they're going to have a higher standard of income as we do. In, in the world, at least, as I'm positing it, um, you know, we actually do have to worry about green growth. Uh, we do have to worry about future generations, because growth, as we're talking about it, could lead to very disruptive future impacts that are vastly bad for future generations. And this is something we've never dealt with as an economic system, and I don't see it uh, emerging uh, in any case. Okay, so with that somewhat more pessimistic note, um, I'll close. But lots for us to pick up on, Jason. Um, that was excellent, thank you very much. Yes, uh, when we gathered at the Chatham House meeting to discuss green growth um, a couple of weeks ago, um, the consensus in the room, with the exception of a rather grumpy representative of the media, um, was that a systemic change was necessary and an incremental approach was insufficient in relation <coughs> to the challenge. 